What's happening, everybody? This is Roy from The Fit, and you are watching CMS TV. Chris Aiken presents, and I, of course, am Chris Aiken. And on the show today, one of the hardest working guys in the world of hard rock and heavy metal. He's out there with his band, The Fifth. Uh, looks like he's going to be out there, at least in some capacity, with his old band, Cold Sweat. He's out there with AEW. He's <laughs> everywhere. He's the one, the only singer of The Fifth. He is Roy Cathy. Roy, how are you? Uh, my friend, thank you for, for the uh, most gracious introduction. Uh, I feel like that old skit back in the nineties in living color. Remember the, uh, the Jamaican family. You, I've got 17 jobs, man. I've got, you've only got eight jobs, man. Now nah, it's, you know, you know how the music business is now. You got to really get out there and, and hustle, especially in, in the rock and hard rock genre. So, uh, I'm just out there grinding, bro. I hear you, man. Well, you're doing a lot of grinding. Um, we'll start with the fifth, obviously, because I think that's the most important of the things that we'll talk about. Uh, there's a new video for the song Starlight, and I'm assuming there's new music past that. So why don't you catch us up with what's been going on with the fifth and what we can expect coming soon? Well, you know, we're knee deep in, in finishing up uh, the recording process of the new CD of uh, uh, Chris McLernan of Cold Sweat and Saigon Kick fame is producing it. And uh, he's just brought a whole other layer uh, to the band, uh, which I knew that he would from working with him in, in Cold Sweat. So uh, we're about to go into the studio and uh, finish recording the last, I think, three or four songs. But, uh, you know, we're halfway there. Uh, it's been one of those processes where everybody has different schedules and different things going on. So we kind of try and get in there and record a chunk of songs and send them to Chris to do the mixing and all that kind of stuff and then record another chunk. So we're on the second chunk and and Ron, Ron and Aaron at RFK Media have been very you know gracious and patient with us. They're, they've never put any kind of timetables on us. You know, they've always been like, hey, you know. We just want you guys to make the best uh, record possible. And uh, Chris, I'm you know everybody says that their next one is going to be their their you know thing. But man, I'm I'm really excited about what's coming up for us. Right on. Now, dude, how is it working with Ron as a as a work guy? You know, I I mean it's difficult to work with friends anyway. Friends and family, you know the old right. saying: don't work right. with friends and family. Correct. Right. <laughs> that being said, you've been friends with Ron probably as long as I have, 30 whatever years it's been. You yes. know, but it is a different relationship when you're working as, I don't want to say boss and employee, but sort of, yeah. Right, right, know? right. How, how is it different? The, the great thing about uh, the relationship that I have with Ron is, uh, you know, I'm always going to be a, the fan kid first. You know, right. I mean, the second big concert I went to, it was uh, Helix, uh, Keel, Accept, 
and crocus you know what i mean and if somebody would have told me that kid in the audience that that night you know hey you know you're going to be in a band with that guy in the blonde streak right there and the lead singer is going to be the president of your record label later you know what i mean i, I just i never would have believed it now to have such a close you know and i have been friends with ron it was that la you know you meet through friends and sure. through you know cohorts and of course through mark um but once we got involved uh with the record label and got involved with rfk it went to a whole different other layer of closeness and for me you know just the other day i was texting Ron Keel the latest song lyrics that I come up with for a fifth song because I'm so excited about it. And he texts me right back. And, mm -hmm. I, and I have to sit back, you know, from time to time and go, this is so cool. I'm texting Ron, cool, Ron Keel for him to check out my lyrics. You know what I right? mean? <laughs> but um, as far as, you know, that kind of relationship of working together, whenever you have so much admiration and respect for somebody and look, you cannot say anything bad about Ron Keel. His work ethic is second to none. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. And you're very you're not going to find anybody in the business that will have anything bad to say about Ron. Ron's always been a straight up guy. And, right. and when he's when he looks you in the eye and he, he shakes your hand, that's gospel, you know. So um working with somebody like that and already having like a past with him and then kind of you know, drifting away and then kind of reconnecting on the Monsters of Rock 2020 cruise. And, and it, it's just, it's been a blast, you know, and, and it's cool to say, well, Ron Keel's my label president. You know right. what I mean? It's, it's, it's right. so cool, you know. Dude, dude it, it's so funny you bring this up because I know I look at my phone sometimes and I'll just look at the contact list. And, you know, I've been doing this forever yeah. and ever. So my contact list kind of matches my greatest records in my collection list now. Right. And right. that's that is still I, I don't care how old I get, I still am like, oh my God, that's David Ellison calling me or that's yeah. Ron Keel <laughs> calling me. You know, when when the name comes up on your phone, you're like, wait a minute, I was that 15 year old kid standing outside the bus, you know? Yeah, man. Yeah. And and that's you know, and I think that's part of the passion that's always driven me is I was always a fan first. I right. stumbled upon my ability to sing. I didn't realize that I could. I didn't realize that my father's family had a musical lineage. So I was a fan first. You know what I mean? That's why, you know, pinch me. I was managed by Wendy Dio and got to tour with Ronnie on the Lock right. of the Wolves tour and got to be close, you know, friends with him. I had every Dio cassette, <laughs> you right. know what I mean? And, and went to the concerts and, and, you know, it, it's, it's been really crazy, you know, and, and I'm very, very fortunate to have had these great people come in and out of my life and influence me in so many ways. Sure. Now, now dude, let's, let's talk about you weaving in and out of those relationships a little bit to the project that just got announced today, or, or it became official today, I guess, I guess yes. it got released today. You uh, wrote the, the lead track for what has got to be considered an iconic thing that is uh the the aew release of sting the era's ep uh for people that don't follow wrestling sting is in the same stratosphere <laughs> as hulk hogan or or, or you know stone cold or the rock any of those correct and he is retiring in a week and a half and you kind of wrote the theme to his swan song, man. That's as a wrestling fan, which you are, that yes. has to be just an amazing, an amazing opportunity for you. Um, it's an, um, I, you know, once again, I'm, I'm kind of like at a pinch me kind of, you know, stage in my career, you know, and you know me, I've been doing this for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. um, I've got to thank, uh, you know, a friend of mine, William David, who, uh, who actually put me in touch with uh, Mikey Ruckus, who is the music director for uh, AEW. Okay. Um, you know, uh, last year or so, I did a theme song for uh, one, a uh, intro for Kip Sabian, one right. of the wrestlers on the AEW roster. And it went great, developed a good relationship with Mikey. And, uh, you know, it was just one of those things where it was like, wow, I thought it was super cool to be doing just an, an intro for a wrestler for AEW. And, you know, me and my, me and my fiance would sit and watch AEW 
and when Kip Sabian would come out and, you know, the <laughs> intros playing and, you know, so I really in, enjoyed it just immensely and uh, was really blown away um, when Mikey called me a couple of weeks ago. And I'm telling you, a couple of weeks ago, wow. Mikey, Mikey called me and he was like, hey, we, we'd, uh, we'd like to get you involved on doing uh, a song for Sting. And we'd like for you to cover his the first era of his career, which is the surfer era, the WCW, right. NWA era. And uh, I was like, yeah, man. I mean, I'm, of course, when he tells me that, I mean, I get like goosebumps, right? I'm right. Like, on the phone, like all tripping out. And, you know, you got to play cool, you know. <laughs> you got to be like, oh, that's good, man. You know, that was fantastic, you know. And then he goes, and, you know, Roy, being a, a singer of your caliber and, and songwriter and a true wrestling fan, we'd like for you to write the lyrics. And I was like, <laughs> Then the magnitude of like, oh my God, you you have to write the story of an iconic wrestling figure. Sure, uh, it, it's like the 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 magnitude of all of it started to kind of come in, and he goes, oh yeah, and we're gonna probably try and debut it February the twenty second, and this was like a week and a half, two weeks away. <laughs> wow. So needless to say, uh, I, 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 I tripped out for a little bit and, and panicked, but then I just got to work, man. And, and Chris, you know me, I'm a, I'm an old school wrestling fan. Me and you right. were talking about doing, you know, doing some shows mm -hmm. about it. Right. And, uh, I, I just, it was easy for me because literally the second Tuesday of every month at Cumberland County arena, when the NWA used to come. I was ringside. So I used to go as a kid. I watched it growing up. I watched it as an adult. So I had like a, you know, I watched the formation of the four horsemen. I watched the introduction of Sting to the NWA territories and later the WCW. I was there. So I was just able to really on a, on a organic level draw from my experience and, and knowing sure. his background and everything. And, I was really lucky, man. I, I the song had great energy. I caught the vibe right away, and I was able to, you know, come up with some good lyrics that I feel capture it. You know, uh, and it, and it definitely does. And and I mean, I think that, you know, they were right in grabbing somebody that was a hardcore wrestling fan. Because if they would have grabbed somebody that learned about Sting on Wikipedia, it wouldn't have captured that energy. It would have, right. you know, there there's something to growing with any product to write about it, you know, right. creatively. And I think that's one of the things that you really captured with Neon Warrior. Yeah. Well, you know, and Sting is one of those guys that was really always respected. It didn't matter mm -hmm. what promotion he went to. He was always held up as one of the top guys and one of the most respected guys backstage. So, you know, for me, I knew that since this was going to be the kickoff because they went through four stages of his career. You know, they did right. the Joker area. They did the w WWE, the TNA uh, and, and the AEW. I knew that, you know, since I was kind of starting off the story, I had to like really come out all guns blazing. That's why there's the screams at the beginning, you know, to kind of signify how he would come out and do the, ow, you know, right. So I, I incorporated the Scorpion death lock and the lyrics and stuff like that. So I really just tried to, um, Chris, I tried to go back to that, that kid, you know, ringside, you know, grow 12, 13 years old, 14 years old, you know, and, and just kind of capture that energy. Are you going to be ringside next week? Or are you going to be TV side next week? I, I am unfortunately going to be TV side. When we were yeah. first talking, Mikey, Mikey was uh, hoping to get me some comps, but boy, they're, they're clamping down on this one because it's Sting's final match. Sure. So they're, they're, they're not giving out the media passes and the amount of comps. I mean, they're, they're going to have the sports illustrated and the ESPNs and all those, you know, the big wig guys sure. are going to be taking up those spots. So, but I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to be watching it on pay-per-view and, and, uh, what a great career. And here he's like 65 and he's still doing high spots off of the top of, I mean, it's, yeah, great. he's nuts. He's he's literally nuts. Some of those spots where he's climbing up like around the barricade and jumping off of the the top of the the entrance ways into the into the sections. 
Right. I'm like, you know, that's young buck stuff. That is definitely not sting 65 year old stuff. No. no. <laughs> and, and, uh, you know, it just goes to show how much, how much respect that he has backstage and how much he wants to go out all guns blazing. And you right. can't help but not cheer for somebody like that. My only problem, and here me and you are going to go down the wrestling rabbit hole yep, here. Of course. <laughs> I, I, I don't know how this storyline is going to play out, man. I mean, it's it. how can they put the Bucks over in Greensboro uh, on his retire? I mean, if they drop the belts to the Bucks, that's just going to leave such a bad taste dude. in my mouth. You are, I, I watch AEW every Wednesday with my son who lives in Pittsburgh and we just text constantly every right. minute of the, of the matches. And we were both saying the same thing. They cannot have sting lose, you know, and for people that don't watch wrestling, that is sort of a tradition is that you, mm -hmm. you, you go out counting the lights and then you leave your boots and, yep. Yep. You know, and you walk out. That's sort of the tradition. Sting is way more iconic than that. Sting Wait. is Sting is like Babe Ruth retiring. He should get a speech. He should yeah. get a you know. He should get as much time as he wants in the ring. But they should not have him losing to a team that a lot of people just plain don't like. You yeah. know, and I mean legitimately don't like, right. not just That's wrestling it. don't like. Right. right. And it, it's I, dude. I'm I'm hating the writing right now. I'm. I'm between that and then they trot Ric Flair out like he's going to have something to do with it. I'm like, no, come on. Yeah, yeah, and see, that's kind of been the problem with AEW the whole time is they've got a lot of talent, and mm -hmm. in my opinion, they've they've got enough TV time. Uh, yeah. they're, they're not really utilizing the talent and, and the, the writing right now. There's no long-term storytelling. There's no real storytelling at all. Right. And, um, you know, I love opening the door to New Japan. I love I love all that kind of dream match stuff that you'll never see with any other promotion. I love that. But you still got to have some kind of angle. You got to have some kind of story uh, to mm -hmm. make it all work. And, and they're kind of falling short on that. Well, and, and the thing is with the dream matches, if you didn't watch that stuff, if you never watched New Japan, mm -hmm. it ain't a dream match to you. You know, right. that's, that's that's been kind of my biggest bugaboo to it is, I mean, I personally follow all of it. Like you, I'm, you know, if there's a wrestling match in a gym somewhere here, I want to know the results, but right. you know, but that being said, the, the casual fan grew up on WWE, which insulated their product. So a dream match in WWE was like Kurt angle and the rock. You know, right. guys that were grown in WWE, since they don't do any growing in AEW, you know, bringing in Takeshita as an example. I know yeah. he's great. I know he's legitimate. I know right. Will Ospreay is great. I know he's legitimate. And I know he's not going to move 25 tickets. Right, because, unfortunately. Which, because he hasn't established himself here. And right. I, I've been saying, and I know now we're all the way down the rabbit hole. We'll come back to music. I swear. But, but I knew you, this would happen with me. And of you. course, of course. <laughs> do you think, and, and this is something I've been proposing to my kid as what they should do. They should actually go the brand, sp the brand split route, split the two shows, build, build rivalries for, since they're going to play rankings, Build rivalries for the number one number one contender on each show. Have one pay per view with that is the two number one contenders from each each show become the true number one contender, and then the next pay per view have them wrestle the champion. Right that yeah. that would build storytelling. It would build rivalries. It would build you know as a, just as an example. Last night we had a. It was a great match that the the match that closed last night with mm -hmm. Swerve and Samoa Joe and Hangman and all that. Yep. But it had no reason to happen. None. Right. I mean, and it was like, okay, what does this prove? What does it build? It didn't make me want to go buy a revolution pay-per-view. No. Just no. Blood, and, you know? Well, see, I think me and you are on the same page. And and I've I've heard some uh some talk on the dirt sheets that what they're talking about doing is making ROH the development brand like next. Okay. 
right? And then kind of split them like exactly what you're saying. And look, Tony Khan's got enough money. Get a performance center going in Jacksonville, where yeah. your headquarters are, because I watch it. The I watch the whole product. And man, mm -hmm. you 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 got to admit, man, that performance center that the WWE has set up and next was brilliant. And when you watch a next show and those kids are cutting a promo and you see the kids cut a promo on AEW night and day. Oh those, yeah, those, yeah. Those performance center kids, they they're training from this time to this time and they've got acting classes from this time to this time, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? So they're they're making them superstars in every sense of uh, the word. So I think me and you are in agreement on oh. what direction yeah. AEW should be. Going. We are, man. And and I mean you see it <laughs> Yeah, you can look at like Jade Cargill as an example. She went to WWE and they can't even put her on TV because she's just not professionally ready. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I used to be, you know, I loved her look when she first came out. Yeah. But when I saw her in the ring, I knew she was complete trash. And mm -hmm. I used to dog her out. Well, I heard it, I saw an interview with her after she left AEW. The first time that they sent her to the ring to give somebody a chair shot, they just put a chair in her hands and go, <laughs> You know, and it's yeah, like, man, right. I mean, you're putting your your lives in other people's hands out there, man. And chair shots, you know, yeah, we know that could that could really fuck somebody up, you yeah. know, if we've done exactly. wrong. And uh, exactly. it's 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 a mess. But uh, I'll I'll say it till I'm blue in the face for all the the warts and the flaws that AEW has. If it wasn't for AEW, WWE would never have competed. They, they I agree. Would, if shit, they would have been. been feeding us the same bullshit that they had for the past several years. Yeah, so. I agree. I agree. And now both products are, are watchable. So that's good to me. So, and tonight I'll be watching TNA and uh, new Japan. There you go. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> well, tonight, everybody's going to be listening to neon warrior, the new song from you, sir, uh, celebrating sting. So why don't, um, why don't we take a little break here and we'll play, uh, we'll play the song neon warrior. And then we'll come back with some more with Roy Cathy from the fifth and we'll be back. It's Chris Aiken presents. Right back here on Chris Aiken presents, or as we're going to call it, um, CAW, I guess, <laughs> Chris Aiken wrestling show. Cause that's what we're doing. We are chatting with Roy Cathy of the fifth and Roy, you, we're going to change directions from wrestling a little bit. We're going to get back to music. We're not going to go to the fifth quite yet though, because Ron Keel announced another project with you, this live record from cold sweat, which I don't know that anybody even knew existed maybe six months ago. So tell us a little bit about this. This is exciting news because there really hasn't been any cold sweat stuff or very little in a long time. We are literally the band that would not die. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, cold sweat never got its just due. We, mm -hmm. we came out just a little bit too late, like a lot of other bands did. Uh, and, and, if you heard the Cold Sweat record, uh, it, it it's a cult it's a cult classic. Mm -hmm. People love that record. Sure. So whenever we got together uh, on the 2020 Monsters of Rock cruise, um, they recorded our um, show in the theater. <clears throat> so we've been sitting on that for a while, and we've also been sitting on the demos that we did after Cold Sweat lost our deal. So right. I've been sit we've been sitting on those demos as well. Now they've been passed around like a $10 hooker on the internet already, but 
they haven't been properly mixed and mastered and done the done the right way. So uh, you know, we did the Monsters of Rock cruise. We got together and and we did the uh, Monsters on the Mountain thing. And then I I developed my relationship with with Ron and, and Aaron at RFK. And then it just uh, and since Chris is working so closely on the fifth project, producing it. It just it popped up in conversation and Chris sent the demos and the stuff off to Ron and Ron's like, we need to do something with this. Right. And we were like, OK. And they concocted this whole crazy ass idea because we were, you know, we're appearing at the M3 festival this year, which is super cool because I've always wanted to play that festival. Sure. And uh, it just seemed to make sense that since we have the festival coming up let's let's put a polish on these things let's mix them down let's get some old photos that nobody's ever seen and and let's put this thing out and uh man they jumped on it and they got it done which once again is a testament to ron's work ethic aaron renee keel chris mcclurin i mean everybody just worked so hard to put this thing together and uh i'm super excited about it man i mean it, it brings back a lot of memories uh it it there's some great songs on there uh, from the demos and the live show from the from the cruise at the theater. You know, you kind of pick up that magic of us not playing together in, in 30 years and, and getting sure. back up on stage together is uh, is really cool. And it's definitely live. You can hear me huffing and puffing. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Let me ask you this, Roy, just because I, I'm, I'm always curious about this. I don't think I've ever asked anybody this. When you when you form a band like you did, obviously with Cold Sweat, you think you're taking over the world. Let's be honest. That's that's the the mind. If it isn't the mindset, then you might as well not form the band. Right. When it doesn't happen that way, do you? This is kind of a two part question. Do you feel like you failed? And then, how long does it take before you start feeling like? the the internet picking it up as it has for you and and making your band more of a cult classic and there's several bands in that category a band like junkyard comes to mind right, did not right. have big success but now i bet they have more fans now than they did in the day i'm thinking right. you're the same way so a did it feel like a failure for you and b how long did it take before it started picking up and you started feeling it and being like Oh, well, maybe this was a good thing that I did. <laughs> well, for me, it was all, you know, uh, timing. I mean, it was just, it was just poor timing. And we were with a, with a poor label, you know, MCA was already known for, you know, shoddily handling any other rock acts besides Leonard Skinner, you know, right. um, and not only did we get lost in the MCA shuffle, we also just, we got enveloped by the entire grunge movement right. and you know for me everything happened so fast with the cold sweat thing because they were looking for the singer when only left to join lynch mob they looked for a singer for six months every singer in la tried out i fly in on a monday and never been on a plane audition on <laughs> wednesday sign a record deal on friday we go into the studio in two weeks my mom and dad have wow. to mail my clothes to me so <laughs> wow it, it was like the the fame and the fast pace. You're managed by Wendy Dio, major label, Mark Ferrari. You're on a tour bus. You're touring with Ronnie. Things aren't right. Records mm -hmm. aren't in the stores. They're botching the distribution. Why aren't they putting out the video? That you know, there were there were warning signs all along the way. And for me, I was a 23, 24 year old kid from North Carolina. I'm riding on a tour bus, Chris. I'm like, God damn, <laughs> shit. Oh, this is great. And, but I'd hear Mark and the rest of the guys and Wendy and everybody's bitching and they're, they're not happy. And right. then as quickly as it happened, it was over. And wow. then you got, you got lost in the spiral of the grunge movement. And Wendy, we had major management and we had the Jason Floms come in and we had all these big time a &R guys come in to showcase after we lost the MSA deal. Dude, if you were in Metal Edge magazine smiling, they weren't fucking signing you. Yeah, yeah. They were. If you were, if you appeared in Metal Edge once like this, <laughs> they, they ain't fucking signing you. 
Right. And it didn't matter if, if you had great songs, if you had past rock stars in the band, when you did your magic, didn't matter. They weren't fucking signing. You. So mm-hmm. for me, it's like the whole thing and my whole LA experience of Cold Sweat, it, it spiraled real fast. It was a five year orgy of awesomeness. And then it just ended as fast as it did. We got caught up in the grunge movement. And me, man, I just kept slogging along in the trenches you know i left la i went to atlanta from atlanta i went back home to north carolina i never stopped singing and whether it was a a a beer bar that smelled like piss and and blood i was playing there on a friday saturday night you know i was still out there singing all through the years so for me i always kind of tried to keep it on on the on the positive tip that hey man most people never get the chance to do the shit that you've done sure so you know i know in my heart of hearts that I was caught up in a, and I, I was a victim of circumstances and bad mm-hmm. timing. It wasn't that we put out an inferior product, but it's still kind of hard from the outside looking in going, sure. ah, you know, God, we could have been huge. Oh, we could have been this. I, I could have had a Porsche by now, but, you know, <laughs> but, but at the end of the day, man, I'm still doing something that I love sure. and I'm still at, at this stage in my life and career. I'm a fucking, I've got three deals going on. I'm doing intros for staying, you know, I mean, come on, you know? Yeah. Do you, do you feel, do you look back at it now and say, well, no matter, no matter what it did, it is something that I genuinely look at and will always be proud of. Absolutely. With, with, with a hundred percent certainty, I know that, um, that cold sweat record stands on its own to this day. If it stands a toe to toe with any of the ones that went multi-platinum of the era. Mm -hmm. And everybody knows that if they ever saw us live and ever seen it, they would have been like that band should be massively huge. So I'm extremely proud of the cold sweat uh, experience. And I'm the one when I was playing those beer bars, I was the only one that was still playing the Cold Sweat songs. You know, I right. mean, in, in my set when we were doing like covers and stuff, the fifth started as a cover band. Uh, you know, dude, I was playing Cold Sweat music. Yeah, you know, I right. didn't stop. You know, because I still believed in it. Sure, and, and the one thing that I know not from seeing it personally, because I have not, but from honestly from my partner Neely that that watched <laughs> you guys play at the Kiss Cruise, he said that you bring energy like a twenty year old. You know, on right. stage, you're still you're still 20 year old energetic, not 50 year old energetic, which is a, a you know a rare thing these days for guys that have been in the business 30 years. Well, you know, I think my secret is uh, I didn't do all the cocaine, I didn't smoke <laughs> all the weed, I didn't drink all the liquor. Uh, now, honestly, man, I, I was always Mister Moderation. I, I was never, I didn't go too crazy. Uh, and I was always a singer nerd, you know, I got to protect my voice. Oh, I got to drink my hot tea, you know, Oh, I can't do this, you know, because for me, I came from a sports background. Then I started singing in bands. I always approached it as almost like a training for a fight kind of thing. You got to be in good physical condition. You got to be able to have good, good wind cardio. And Mm -hmm. so I've just taken care of myself. But the biggest thing, Chris is I never stopped singing. Right. I never kept stopped working the muscle. Yeah, I, kept, kept, working I, the muscle. I kept singing, you know, and it's like, and I went right back to the bars. You know, I went from doing headlining shows where I, I'm a 45 minute opening set or a one hour set, hour and a half tops to going back to three one hour sets, you know. Right. If you don't learn how to keep, keep you know, keep on top of yourself, you're going to burn out real bad. Right on, man. Well, dude, let's wrap this one up talking a little bit about the uh, current single that you have, uh, Starlight, a great tune, uh, super, super catchy. Talk a little bit about this one and um, how writing this one, it is a little different from the previous album. So mm-hmm. talk a little bit about writing this and, and why it is different. Were you trying something new or is it just where where you're at today versus a few years ago? Well, you know, a few years ago uh, when we got this lineup together to do the ep it was in we were in our infancy we were still kind of feeling each other out you know justin my guitar player you know was sending me demos that he had for years and years and i kind of picked and choose the ones that i kind of like and as you know just like with anything the more time you spend together the more you mold as a unit the more you start developing and um 
we just decided to just embrace our our 80s roots and just really not put any kind of labels or any kind of real direction on on what we're going to sound like or, or, or anything. And when he brought me this song, it was clearly a tip of the hat to Cold Sweat. And he right. said that. He goes, this is this is my cry and shame. And I'm like, okay, let, let's hear it. And, um, you know, the biggest thing about The Fifth is we're all so comfortable with each other. We've got a label that supports us and is not putting any pressures on us. They're not, they're not putting their boot on our neck. And it's right. opened us up so freely to explore, you know, whatever we've got. And right now, the record that we've got, it, it goes from the 80s sound and stuff to stuff that would be more in the modern rock realm in the 90s into the 2000s. I mean, there's just, it's one great big rock and roll smorgasbord that we're getting ready to put out. And, and, you know, we don't want to put any labels on the band. So it's like people are going to listen to it and it's going to be like, they're going to kind of feel like they've gone through the seventies. They've gone through the eighties. They've gone through okay. the nineties. They've gone through the two thousands. And, and, and I think in, in, in the grand scheme of things, that's kind of what everybody kind of wants, man. That, you know, yeah. if you want to be a well-rounded music fan, you want to have your roots in, in your, in your classics, you know, and you want to have an open mind of what's going on today, you know. So mm -hmm. uh, I'm excited about what we got coming up. And Chris McLernan is going to be one of those producers later down the road. That's okay. really big stuff because we released this on the RFK uh, Live the Rock compilation CD. Mm -hmm. when it was just our basic mix and we turned it over to Chris. And dude, Chris turned it into what it is. <laughs> right. So a good producer that you can trust that is just, he's going to enhance it, not change it. And that's what Chris did with it. And man, we couldn't be happy. The video is like, it's a big budget video. Right. Uh, that, that's not on a big budget. <laughs> and 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 uh, I have mastered the art of fake it till you make it. So. Right. <laughs> well, and, and I will say in video form, you definitely have done that because Shake Little Sister looks like a giant, huge video as well. Well, well I've, I've got to give credit where credit's due. That is from our uh, uh, director, Jaden Frost. He is incredibly talented. He's done the past two videos. And if it wasn't for him and his connections out at uh, Scary Point, which was the haunted trail uh, that we shot the video at, uh, right. you know, all those big budget sets and everything, they were already there, lit up, ready to go. We just had to create a storyline. The song, you know, of course, kind of fit with it. And it was just right timing. For the first time in my life, the timing was right. <laughs> <laughs> Very good, man. So, dude, what is the, uh, what's the timeline for the release? Is it spring, summer? Or what, what are you looking at? Uh, the fifth is probably going to be, you know, since the cold sweat thing kind of got plopped in on us and everything, the labels kind of shifted their priorities to the cold sweat to get that ready for the M okay. M3 performance in May. So I'm expecting the fifth to be into the studio uh, next month sometime, finish up a couple of tunes. I'm, I'm late summer, you know, okay. late summer, you know, we're, we're still trying to stay on a, on a pretty uh, uh, tight timeline. Just, we okay. want to get it done and we want to deliver it to Ron and Aaron. So very cool, man. Well, it's exciting time for anybody that is a fan of you or the fifth or cold sweat or AEW or, oh, you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is definitely an exciting time. So I tell you what we're going to do, uh, Roy, we're going to wrap this one up with the video for starlight what what that you haven't already told me can you tell me about the video well you know uh ron and the label were like hey we got to release a video we want to do a video for starlight and we we're like oh my god really are you serious so i contacted Jaden. uh i sent him the song and uh he had just got finished working a season out there at the haunted trail doing all their online social media filming and stuff like that, television commercials and whatnot. And he was like, hey, well, they just finished up out there. Let me call my friend who's the creative director. Hey, can my can we shoot a video out there? They're like, sure, come on out. They let us they let us go out there. We we shot it two nights. Uh, the staff was amazing. The sets were amazing. Jaden put together a storyline that just kind of captures the song. And uh, you know Back in the day, a video like that, that's, I mean, 
Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's too bad it's not really the video era anymore, but sure. we really wanted to make a video that was like a mini movie. And, mm -hmm. and man, dude, Chris, I got a werewolf in my video, brother. A werewolf. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> Excellent. Well, let's check it out right now. It is Starlight, brand new music from the fifth. Uh, Roy, where, where should we tell people to go to keep up with you and the fifth and tour dates and buy stuff and all that stuff? You, uh, you can find us on the interwebs at, uh, uh the fifth music.com. Uh, you can also find us on Facebook, uh, the fifth NC, uh, you know, we're out there. You can find me out there as well. We're easy to find. Please, uh, please log in. Come see us. There you go. Well, we're going to come see you right now with starlight, the new video from the fifth and Roy as always, man. It's great talking to you here on Chris Aker presents. You're the man, Chris. We love you, brother. Thank you. Assured Window Cleaning specializes in window cleaning, chandelier cleaning, blind cleaning, gutter cleaning, and post-construction cleaning. In business since 1947, Assured Window Cleaning has probably been serving its customers in Cleveland for 75 years. As a family-owned and operated business, Assured Window Cleaning has built their reputation on trust and delivering the best results possible. When you need window cleaning services for your home or business, contact Assured Window Cleaning. We're one of the top window cleaning companies in all of Cleveland for both residential and commercial. Visit our website today at www.assuredwindowcleaning.com or call us at 440-989-0122 for a quote. And remember, Everybody knows Tony. Contact Assured Window Cleaning today.